Welcome to the first episode of Health Hour with me, Tony Preckwinkle, President of the Cook County Board of Commissioners. We have a great lineup of guests as we talk about the most important issues of today, our personal health and the health of our communities, and our fight against COVID-19. Our first guest is Israel Rocha, CEO of Cook County Health. Coming to us from New York City, where he served as CEO of Elmhurst Hospital and Queens Hospital as part of the New York City Health System, Mr. Rocha was appointed to the position of CEO of Cook County Health late last year and has hit the ground running. Mr. Rocha, welcome. Thank you so much, Madam President. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Okay, let's begin at the beginning. How did you get interested in healthcare and, and leading a major health system? You know, I originally started my career on the policy side, and I had the pleasure of working for uh, a member of Congress from uh, actually my my hometown, which was originally in Texas before I was a New York uh, uh, before I worked in New York, and uh, I actually uh, you know got to to understand how policy was working and how it could be done. But there was a part of me that wanted to be on the front line, really helping make that difference. But it was really a, a, a an experience that happened to my family that we lost my grandparents. First, it was my grandmother. And she, I didn't know, but at that time, the hospitals that we have didn't have the most advanced stroke features. And so she suffered a, a very um, large stroke event in her life, and it was, uh, it was her final event. But later on, I learned that there was technology. There was things that could have been offered at the hospital um, and could have maybe given us a few more years with her. And those types of, of, of experiences really changed you. And what I saw was that we didn't have a public health system that forced people to keep the services available in the community. And we weren't a small community by any means. We weren't large, but we weren't small. We're about a little over a million people, enough to have the services to have those uh, availability uh, in the community. And then I learned real quickly what it means to have a public system who pushes others to be in, uh, keep up their services, to create that access, that openness, that, that approach of equity in healthcare. And I decided at that point that I wanted to make sure that what happened to me and my family and my grandmother didn't happen to others and that I could do something about it. So it was the absence of access to high quality health care that prompted your interest in public health and your professional life. Correct. Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, you came here, bless you, in December mm -hmm. to run our health and hospital system at near, needless to say, a critical moment in the history of our county and surely the history of healthcare in this country. Tell us a little bit about the challenges you faced, um, and then we'll get to the pandemic. Sure, so, you know, coming from New York uh, in, in New York City, you know, Elmhurst and Queens Hospital were really the epicenter of the epicenter, as New York was the epicenter. We really had to, uh, you know, build the plane while we're building it, and really at the early stages of COVID, uh, help to bring all the resources we could and, and, and to make things uh, happen for patients in a meaningful way. And, and that's what I'm so excited that we're doing here at Cook County and, and the public system at Cook County Health overall. They're putting together the most amazing resources to make sure that patients have access, not just in times of COVID, but in every day, in every event possible. They're working to put resources, innovations, research, and access uh, to come to life for patients in a meaningful way. I think some of the struggles are the struggles that we all confront. Uh, we have, we have, of course, we have issues as a system with ensuring that we have the proper resources, revenue, and access to staff to continue our operations. And as as patients in the community, we have issues of, of socioeconomic factors that create uh, risk factors in how we access healthcare. It creates barriers, and that's why we're so committed and 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 under your leadership are committed to ensuring that equity is always centered into healthcare, which means that we're there to remove any barriers that people can have to getting the healthcare that they need. Our health and hospital system in Cook County is 180 years old and throughout its history, it's always taken whoever comes to our door, regardless of their ability to pay or their uh, status as residents or citizens. Um, what challenges does that present to a health and hospital system? Well, you know, the biggest one is that we want to make sure we have a responsibility to be resilient. And that means we were handed, and, and that's all of our staff right now who operate the system at every level, were handed this amazing gift. It was a system that, as you said, has been here for 180 years, guaranteeing health access to patients. And that's all comers. Um, our challenge is to make sure that we operate it in a way that still maintains that access, but that we're resilient that we have the financial resources to hand it off to the next generation, that we won't be the last. And so we have to make sure that we're working very diligently to get the resources in. 
And one of the things that I think when we hear these words, uncompensated care and what it means in charity care, I think we sometimes don't know exactly what that means. And where Cook County Health is a little different is that we provide health to all comers, not just to emergency services, not just to primary care services, but to the most essential specialty services. And especially for those events that maybe are not reaching the level of life endangerment, but they are reaching the level of life impacting and that they really can change life. And so if it's a, if it's a critical surgery or if it's exploratory surgery or the things that you need to find out about your well-being, your body and your person, we're there to be your partner. And it's that access that drives up our cost and we have to find resources and ways to make sure that we can get the resources to cover that cost. So just to help out our viewers, when we look at healthcare, we talk about uh, primary care, specialty care, and tertiary care, which is our hospital system, okay? Explain what, what those uh, differences are. So primary care is, is what you see every day when you go to your doctor, when you go to your annual wellness visit, when you have a sore throat, or when you don't know what's wrong with you. It's your first access point. It's a doctor who helps run your critical care, and they're your partner in healthcare. And so they're your primary person that you go to, hence the word primary care. And then they open up the access to specialists. And in specialists, those are the types of, of people that you find who are very dedicated to a particular field of medicine that also often do surgical or interventional procedures, meaning they actually go in and repair your body physically uh, with, with tools and equipment. And so that is usually like a neurosurgeon, a general surgeon, a urologist. Those are the type of specialists that we get access to that help you determine your health. And tertiary is like when you come to the hospital in a very, very serious condition and you start usually in our emergency room when you are accessing tertiary care level. All right. And of course, our health and hospital system provides all three, primary care, yes, specialty care, and, and hospital care to our patients. Now, we've been yes, particularly challenged in the present environment by the pandemic. How is our health and hospital system responding? So, you know, uh, again, we're, we're very fortunate to be a public system and that we have the support of, 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 of yourself and, of the, and of, the, of the Board of Commissioners who are able to ensure that we have the resources. How we've responded is by hiring additional staff, by bringing the latest medicine that is available in the field, whether it is the latest medicine that is being pioneered to help people be able to have the highest outcome uh, possible. And that means that they're to reduce any negative impacts of COVID, to get them healthy as quickly as possible. And we know that at times, especially in brown and black communities, access to the highest level of care has been limited. However, in this time, in this moment, here at Cook County Health, there is a commitment to make sure that there is no equity uh, lacking in access, that we have full equity for everyone who wants to be able to get the highest level of care for COVID-19. And so we've had to hire, hire new resources, bring in additional staffing, bring in additional uh, equipment and, and facilities, and even convert our floors moment to moment to make sure that we're meeting the full needs of our patients and that anybody who walks through our doors has access to the best medicine possible to give them the best chance against COVID. Israel, we've talked broadly about the challenges our healthcare system faces, but let's talk specifically now about the pandemic and about vaccinations. What can you tell us about the health and hospital system's efforts to address the pandemic, both through testing and vaccination? You know, we, we have been able to stand up a wonderful uh, contact tracing program that I know our, our, our public health department can elaborate more on, but it is really important right now that we keep that program going. We've brought in well over uh, 200 members, plus we have additional others that are contracted to make sure that while the, while the rate of infection is low, we really can use that program to make sure that it stays low. Our vaccination Israel, program, help us out. Explain what contact tracing is. Not everyone may know. So contact tracing is when we find out that there's a case that's reported, we have a, a great uh, team at our public health division that actually goes in and, and looks at the file, reviews it, and then reaches out to the patients to interview them and ask them a few questions to find out where they may have been and who they may have been in contact with so that we can then trace anybody who may have had contact with that patient and make sure that they get tested and that they're okay and that anyone that they had contacted with is tested and okay. And that really helps us slow that spread down. Okay. All right, good. That's contact tracing. Now, how are we doing on the vaccination front? The vaccine program is going very, very well. Our rollout is going out great. We currently have 17 sites up and running 
more to come. Uh, we've been able to launch an online web page and a portal where people can sign up. We've had almost over a million people register on their desire to get the vaccine. And our most exciting milestone is that in just, uh, in just a, after a few weeks of operations, uh, and even though we're confronting supply challenges on the vaccine side, we're about to administer our 100,000th dose. That means 100,000 vaccinations have been given over the next few days, which is so exciting for us. Additionally, our, our Cook County Department of Public Health has partnered with more than 100 other locations like Jewel Osco, Mariano's, Walgreens, our federally qualified health centers and hospitals that are working in the suburban county area to even expand that even to a further degree. And we are making great inroads and in making sure that the populations of 1A, 1B, our essential workers and anyone over the age of 65 is getting immunized. And it's an exciting moment. And we wanna make sure that we help to get each one of those people who registered with us the vaccine as quickly as possible. But we do ask for a little bit of patience as you read on TV and you see everywhere. Right now, the demand for vaccines really outpaces the supply that we have. But we hope that will change in the next few weeks. And everybody is working collaboratively to make sure that we get it in the arm of the people who want it as fast as possible. All right, thank you for that good news and thank you for joining us for our program. I'm very grateful to you for your willingness to come to New York and head up our health and hospital system. And we look forward to hearing from you on this program in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Today, we're here with Dr. Claudia Feagan, Chief Medical Officer at Cook County Health. Dr. Feagan, how does the COVID-19 vaccine work? The vaccine is safe and effective. We know that no steps were skipped in developing it. Millions of people have already been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated, and we know it's the only thing that's gonna protect us from COVID. The vaccine works by helping your immune system make antibodies against the virus. You cannot get COVID from the vaccine. This vaccine has been proven to be 95% effective against the virus. Are there side effects? You may have a sore arm like any vaccine, feel achy or tired, but it's nothing compared to getting coronavirus. Right now, we're doing people 65 and older and frontline workers. They're getting vaccinated in community health centers, vaccination sites, select pharmacies. More vaccine is on the way, and everyone who wants to get vaccinated will be able to be vaccinated. Learn more at vaccine.cookcountyil.gov or call 833-308-1988. Next up, we're bringing on a pair of fierce community advocates. Since the very beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Rachel Rubin and Dr. Kieran Joshi have been serving as co-leads of our COVID-19 recovery efforts at the Cook County Department of Public Health. While continuing to serve as physicians in their own respective fields, Drs. Rubin and Joshi have also been charged with spreading the good word about how we can protect ourselves, our families, and our neighbors. Thank you for joining us. We're going to begin with Dr. Rubin. Tell us your story. Um. I was born and raised in Chicago, um, grew up, uh, I was a young child during the time of civil rights and in the late 60s and early 70s, and um, grew up with a, a great sense of, of wanting to be engaged in, in social justice and fighting for, for equality. And so, but I was also sort of a, a math and science nerd on top of that. And uh, when I went to college at University of Illinois, um, I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to go to medical school, but I knew that I would always regret not trying. So when it came time to study for the exams, the MCAT, um, I did that and I got in. And so uh, with an undergraduate degree in math of all things. And when I was in uh, medical school, when you have to decide what field you wanna go into, um, I was certainly interested in being a clinician and working with patients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but I also saw myself at the core as being sort of a, a, an activist, a social activist. And I wanted to choose a field of medicine where I felt that I could be engaged on a community level, not just on a personal level with my patients one-on-one. -on -one. So um, I became familiar with the field of occupational and environmental medicine. And at Cook County Hospital then, as it was called obviously before Strozier Hospital, they had a joint residency of internal medicine and occupational medicine, which fit the bill for me perfectly. And I also could, could remain in Chicago. So um, that's what I did. I was in a joint program of internal medicine and occupational medicine at Cook County and have pretty much stayed 
within the Cook County Health System most of my career, with a couple of years going and working overseas in Southern Africa and a couple of other years uh, working outside of the system, uh, but being in the system part time. And I have worked in a variety of roles, but basically at my core doing internal medicine and occupational medicine and working to advocate for my patients and for the communities to bring free and affordable, I'm sorry, free and uh, quality care to my patients and to work for social justice issues that relate to health equity um, throughout my career, advocating especially being the occupational end, which is job and environmentally related diseases and illnesses. So being a worker's advocate. And I, and I take that to my, to my core. And that's where my public health training comes in. My, my master's of public health is in environmental and occupational health sciences. And so about six and a half years ago, um, instead of doing predominantly clinical work, I moved over to our Department of Public Health, our Cook County Department, and have now do clinical work once a week uh, regularly. And the rest of the time I'm doing, uh, you know, community-based uh, public health. All right. All right. Let's yeah. let let's hear what uh, let's hear what Dr. Uh, Dr. Joshi's journey has been. Karen. Thanks so much, Madam President. Um, so I am uh, born and raised in the south suburbs of, uh, of Chicago, uh, the son of immigrants um, who came here in the early 70s um, from uh, originally from the town that Mahatma Gandhi was born in. And so was uh, profoundly influenced by those ideas of egalitarianism, compassion, and social justice. Um, and so really share some of the same um, sensibilities that my co-lead does. Um, have uh, gone on to be a product of um, nearly all public institutions from elementary school to college at the University of Illinois, um, to medical school again at the University of Illinois, um, and uh, spent a year as an intern at um, the, at the time, brand new uh, John H. Stroger Hospital. And what can I say? I, you know, I, I fell in love with the place um, and, and um, I'm so happy now to be back, um, both with the Department of Family Medicine um, as an attending physician there, where I'm able to do clinical work at Stroger. Um, which is really the honor of my life, and uh, so now serve as the co-lead of the Cook County Department of Public Health, along with my colleague, um, Dr. Rubin. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, how we can look at our data um, to tell the story, uh, the stories, I think, that need to be lifted up to advance health equity. That, that is, um, that it's not individual behaviors, um, it's not culture, it's not genetics that are behind the profound differences in health outcomes that we see, but rather it's uh, injustice, it's structural racism, and um, looking at how we can bring to bear the power of our local government to address those issues. One of the disturbing things about coverage of the uh, disparate impacts of the pandemic on brown and black communities is the uh, the perception, perhaps, that it's uh, that it's our fault that somehow you know we're not taking good care of ourselves, and the pandemic comes along and and just you know wipes out communities. And as you point out, that's not the case at all. It's 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 historic access to health care. It's it's uh, inequities in access to health care. It's uh, structural racism, as you point out. Something important to keep in mind. That's exactly right. And there's polling, you know, that was done earlier on in the pandemic that indicated very clearly that, for example, African-American folks were much more likely than their white counterparts to wear a mask. So, you know, there's a there are some false narratives out there that I think we can, again, use the data to uh, to address. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Help us help us out a little bit. Where are we in the course of this pandemic? I think I would say that we're sort of midway, but the light is there at the end of the tunnel. Um, with vaccine, um, on top of us maintaining the kinds of uh, controls that are in place, like the masking and physical distancing and not congregating in, in large groups and washing our hands and having our uh, 
institutions uh, and organizations adhere to that as well and providing safe workplaces by providing the personal protection, continuing to do all of those things. But vaccine is what's really going to get us over the hump. Vaccine is the only way that we're really going to conquer the pandemic. Does it mean that we're going to get rid of COVID-19 as an illness completely? Probably not, but it will be a controllable disease and it won't be as uh, life-threatening, similar to, to influenza. And as we're now rolling out vaccine, um, I think it's going to take, I would say, we're going to see incrementally improvements throughout the next year for sure. But we have to have the vaccine out and we have to have most people vaccinated between 70 and 80 percent of the population and not just in this country, worldwide, in order to get this pandemic really under control. And I think we're on our way to doing that. But we have a long way to go because the vaccine is in short supply everywhere. But we are getting there. For once, I can see some some hope there. Right. I think the important thing to remember of what you said is we've got to get control of it worldwide. And presently, as I understand it, there are 130 countries, 2.5 billion people in which not one person has been vaccinated. And it's a reflection, as you point out, of the shortage of supply and the fact that developed countries have better access to the supply there is than those countries that are um, struggling economically. Right, absolutely. And, you know, we live in, you know, our world doesn't recognize borders the way they used to. Travel is, is almost instantaneous. Certainly communication is instantaneous. And to say that it's okay for sub-Saharan Africa not to have much vaccine, but it's all right then for more developed countries, that's ridiculous. Um, there's absolutely no uh, reason for that. We need to be looking at this on a global scale. scale. We need to be helping out our, our brothers and sisters and, and siblings and parents, you know, our neighbors throughout the world in order to get a grip on this. There's just no way that we can look at just the United States in a microcosm and think that if we handle it here, that the rest of the world will follow. If anything, we need to be a leader in that movement to providing access to vaccine uh, everywhere. It's a global pandemic. And as you point out, the fact that we are able to mitigate it here in the United States doesn't mean we'll get control of it unless the vaccine is available all over the world. And we're a long way from that. Let's uh, go to you for a minute, uh, Dr. Joshi. These are difficult times. I think a lot of people are struggling with what I would call plague fatigue. Um, how do you stay healthy? Certainly. Um, so I think first, you know, I'm, I'm really fortunate. Um, I um, have a position uh, of power. Um, I have a lot of privilege and I'm really thankful for that. Um, I'm also fortunate to work in a position in which um, I'm able to address what's happening directly. And I think that's tremendously gratifying. Um, I have incredibly supportive leadership um, from the top down, and I have a wonderful partner in Dr. Rubin. Um, I also have an incredibly supportive family. So once again, I'm just so thankful for all of that. In terms of how we cope um, from day to day, I think it's really important to keep perspective and to take time for self-care to the extent that one can. So take just 10 minutes. Um, you know, listen, pause, listen to some music, um, or go for a walk, feel that, I know it's cold outside, um, I know conditions can be slippery, but feel that wind against your face, it could be tremendously renewing. Use the time if you're work, if you happen to be working from home to, uh, that you would have spent commuting to cook a meal, to cook a healthy meal for yourself and for your loved ones. Um, whatever way you can, um, try to take some time for yourself. Um, I think um, if we can do that, if we can take care of ourselves, then we will certainly get through this. Thank you. I'm going to give you an opportunity, as I did to Mr. Rocha, to talk directly to our communities. What do you want to leave people with today? We'll start with you, since we're with you. Dr. Joshi? Yeah. So I'm very mindful um, as a leader in public health that we have been asking a lot of people. And I'm very empathetic um, to the notion that it's, it's difficult. Um, but please keep in mind whether it's um, addressing your concerns and fears about vaccination and getting that shot, um, whether it's wearing a mask wherever you go when you're out, when you're around others, or whether it's social distancing. 
Um, all of these things are things that we're doing or sacrifices that we're making to protect not only ourselves, but the most vulnerable among us. So um, if we can continue to do the right thing and look out for, again, not only ourselves, but the most vulnerable among us, our seniors, um, folks with chronic conditions, we, I'm confident we can get through this together. Thank you. Dr. Rubin? I mean, I certainly echo my my terrific partner, Dr. Joshi, and also to say that, um, you know, stay the course, be patient. We are trying to get vaccination out to everybody as quickly as we can, using our equity approach and trying to reach out to those communities that have been most impacted. And we have a whole plan within Suburban Cook to not only, uh, but to, to build on the large sites that we've been vaccinating at and build on what our 15 uh, partner hospitals and our federally qualified health centers have been doing, but actually mobile teams and working in communities and going to where people live who cannot leave their communities and who may not trust others outside of their communities to, to really get people where they're at um, to be vaccinated. And But to just be patient with us, we are getting to you as quickly as we can. Uh, we need more vaccination for everybody and be safe. Thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Thank you, Dr. Rubin, for joining us today. And thanks to everyone who's turned into Health Hour at Home. Remember, keep washing your hands, watching your distance, and wearing your mask. Every day, the light at the end of the tunnel gets a little bit brighter, and we'll get through this together. Thank you.